Hello, my name is Autumn Brown and I'm a researcher with Oklahoma State's Oklahoma Oral History Research Project for our activism and education in the Civil Rights Movement Oral History Project. Today, February 24th, 2020, I'm meeting with Lennard Brown to discuss his experiences with school desegregation in Oklahoma City. Mr. Brown, thank you so much for talking with me today. Let's begin by just telling me about yourself. Like, where were you born? A little bit about your family. I was born in Oklahoma City. Um, I actually grew up in the Spencer area. We, we moved there when I was about, I don't know, maybe four. And uh, I attended uh, Dungy Schools from the first grade to the 12th grade. Dungy Schools went from the first grade to the 12th grade at that time. So um, that's kind of my, that's where I started from. Mm -hmm. um, what, tell me a little bit about your family. My family, <clears throat> um, I have a mother and one brother. Well, I have one full brother. I have uh, another half brother and another half sister that grew up separately from me. They grew up in California. And I have a third brother, half brother, a second half brother, who's deceased now. He uh, died when he was about 22. It's funny because, not funny, but I met him probably about a year before he died and for the first time. And then before I really got to know him well, he was gone. So that's kind of my family history. Uh, my family um, basically comes from Oklahoma. Uh, I've learned just through research that my grandfather, my great-grandfather came here from Texas. My great-grandmother came here from uh, Tennessee. So that's kind of what I know about my family history up until now. Okay, what was the community like when you were growing up? Community was poor. I mean, the community I grew up in, Spencer, basically it's called Green Pastures. It was a poor community. I mean, there really were no... Um, <clears throat> everybody in the, in the community was probably about around the same economic level. There was some that were worse off, some that were better off, but generally speaking, it was um, an economically depressed area I grew up in. Okay. Um, and you said that you attended Dungy from first to twelfth grade. Yes. Um, so during this time, schools were completely still segregated. They were completely still segregated. We were in at that time. Dungy was in the Choctaw School District. Choctaw was all white. <clears throat> Dungy was all black. I never knew that Dungy was part of the Choctaw. I yes. always thought it was part of Oklahoma City. It was part of it was uh, in the Choctaw School District um, until I, gr I graduated in nineteen sixty five. The next year. Uh, the patients voted to move to the Oklahoma City School District. So I missed it by a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what were your teachers like at Dungy? I always thought my teachers were great. Um, they uh, seemed to genuinely care about you. They took, they took interest in what happened to you after school hours. You know, they took interest in your home life. <clears throat> So I always thought they were great. As a matter of fact, you know, when I got to college and um, when I got to college, I was prepared um, and most of my classmates were. And then I ran into people from other school districts that, you know, like, for example, didn't know how to use the library system, didn't know about the Dewey Decimal System. But the teachers at Dungy, I thought were great. Mm -hmm. So when you say they took an interest in your home life and stuff, do you have mm -hmm. like examples about of that or like what do you, can you expand on that a little bit? Like what do you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> they, for the most part, they lived, most of them, probably about half of them lived in the uh, community. So, and then even some of them even knew your, you know, your parents. Uh, they knew your aunts and uncles, they knew your cousins. So when I went to, say, for example, got in junior high school, people, you know, they knew who my uncles were, they knew who my cousins were. Uh, you know, um, sometimes they even interacted with, men with members of your family. Like I had one coach that I'd known since I was a little boy, a guy by the name of Maurice Luster. And uh, I knew him since I was like in the first grade. <laughs> Cause he hung out with my uncles. Mm -hmm. Then when I got to high school, uh, he showed up as a teacher. You know, I, I couldn't believe it. So they were, um, I could tell you one story about Clara Looper, if you want to hear it. Of course. Okay. okay. <clears throat> when I was a junior uh, in high school, um, she 
gave us this assignment, and it was to do a black history scrapbook. So you went through magazines, you cut out pictures, articles, put them together in a scrapbook. So for some reason, I decided <clears throat> I wasn't going to do this assignment. I, to this day, I don't know why I didn't do it. She said, okay. She said, where's your parents? I said, they're at work. She said, what about your grandmother? I said, she's at home. She said, okay, let's go. She put me in her car, took me to my grandmother's house, and told her, explained to her why she was there, that I needed to get this assignment done. So she, she wanted my family to know that I wasn't doing my my school work as I should, and took me back to school. And so by the time I got home, everybody knew what was going on. I mean, mm -hmm. my mother, my aunts and uncles, my grandmother, my cousins. So everybody pitched in that day to help me get that assignment done. We got it done in one night. Mm -hmm. But that was an example of the kind of a teacher that Clara Lupe was. She took the time out of her day for one student to go home, to go to his house and, and explain to his grandmother mm -hmm. why he was messing up at school. So, What did that mean for you as a student to see her <clears throat> do that? It kind of opened up my eyes a little bit. Um, it made me, I never listened to the assignment with her, I can tell you that. So that's mm -hmm. what it, that's, that's one thing. But it, it, um, yeah, it opened my eyes. It, it uh, made me wake up a little bit. Yeah. Can you talk about the role of education during the time that you were going through school? What what did education mean for you? Education was also uh, always touted as being important. Uh, <clears throat> my high school class motto was uh, education is the key to the future. Um, and I was lucky that I came along at a time when I did because that's during the time when um, Right after John F. Kennedy was killed and Lyndon B. Johnson was president. And you know, he talked he talked about the great society. He made a lot of uh, um, opportunities for people, you know, with student loans and grants, that kind of stuff, uh, to go to college. So when I finished high school, I mean, there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to college. And you know, make a better life for myself. So that's what education meant to uh, my community. How old were you when you became aware of civil rights activism happening in the community? I was <clears throat> a seventh grader. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in 1959. I started in seventh grade, and I had Clara Lupus class for social studies. And at that time, sit-ins had just started. And up until that point, you know, we had history in elementary school up through the sixth grade, but nobody had actually talked about, uh, in detail, about slavery, mm -hmm. about uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, about segregation. I mean, they really hadn't gone into detail. So, <sighs> I live probably in a cocoon where I was aware of it, but I didn't have to confront it every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could go to movies um, with no problem. We could go, well, there were a lot of restaurants we couldn't eat in. Um, we, played, <clears throat> we played sports against all white teams and generally didn't have many problems. So segregation was something that I was aware of, but not really acutely aware of, or even the reasons for it. So that, that was kind of my, what I, what I knew about segregated schools at that time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm trying to think if I wanna, cause you said a lot there that was really mm -hmm. interesting. So as a seventh grader, when you became aware of all of it, like how mm -hmm. did that change your outlook on, on things or did it change your outlook mm -hmm. on things? Mm -hmm. Probably changed my life, <clears throat> excuse me, because I wasn't aware of it. Once I became aware of it, you know, then I got mad, I got angry and, uh, 
Excuse me. No, you're good. Yeah, I became aware of it. And it changed my life because <sighs> I'm sorry, I... No, you're good. Take your time. Ah, just give me a minute here. <sighs> Take your time. Mm. I wasn't expecting <laughs> to get emotional. <laughs> Not at all. <clears throat> this is a tough period to recount. Yeah. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it made me mad because mm -hmm. I couldn't understand. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> because in my mind, I was as good as them, mm -hmm. and I couldn't understand why. That they failed that way. Damn, I'm sorry. No, you're good. I know, like, some of the people who talk about segregation and integration and desegregation, mm -hmm. like, they talk about it as if it's a blessing, it was a blessing and a curse. And one thing one of my, Joyce Henderson talked about was, the fact that segregation was meant to make you feel inferior and make right. you feel like a second class citizen. So when she talks about desegregation and why it was so important to push for it, she's saying it was those feelings like we're not second, we're citizens, we're not second class citizens, mm -hmm. we're, we're humans. Yeah. But the curse was the losing of the community and the solidarity and stuff like that. Mm. That and was so, the curse, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, before um, before integration, <clears throat> you know, black doctors and black uh, businessmen all lived in the same area. Mm -hmm. Like on the east side of Oklahoma City, you know, they had dentist office. They had <clears throat> several grocery stores. They had all types of businesses that were run by black people mm -hmm. for that community. But once segregate, uh, once integration came, all those people that could left the community, and you know, you've seen you've seen what it's become since then. Mm -hmm. So that was the curse, but the blessing was, you know, we got opportunities that we that my parents didn't have, mm -hmm. and. Um, so that was the blessing part of it. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm a little better than <laughs> Good. Um, I wasn't expecting that. That, was, that surprised me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of times these interviews, like they ask you, mm -hmm. we ask you to rehash all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so it's in the rehashing that you really like connect back with those feelings mm -hmm. back then. So it's totally okay. So like, when you, so can you kind of talk about like the economic climate during this time? So what were tensions like? in the late 50s and early 60s when you were attending schools? You mean the tensions with, uh, between white people? Mm -hmm. You know, as I said before, there really were no, I mean, as a, as a you know, 11, 12 year old, mm -hmm. there really wasn't a lot of tension that I personally could see because we were so insulated. You know, we had everything we needed. <laughs> In our community, we didn't need, really need to go outside for anything. Mm -hmm. So, it didn't really, there really were no tensions from that standpoint because the only time we actually interacted with them was, for me personally, the only time I interacted with them was through athletics. Mm -hmm. You know, we play them, uh, you know, in basketball and football, and you know, we got along with them, okay? We never had, Many issues, yeah, one or two. But for the most part, it was it was just you know just athletic competition, and that was it. Yeah. Um. So there really were no for somebody eleven or twelve. There really were no tensions because I didn't I didn't really face it 
head on that much. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, until later, then as I got older, I understood more. So um, that that was probably uh, caused more attention. The older I got, the more I got out into society, the more I was confronted with uh, segregation. I mean, the first time I walked in a place and they told me I couldn't sit down there. Oof. What was that like? It was not good, I yeah. tell you. Yeah. It was just, uh, you know, once again, I really wasn't, you know, I was more angry than anything mm -hmm. uh, when stuff like that happened. So um, that was just, you know, it didn't surprise me. Um, you just kind of took it as, you know, that's the way things are. You just have to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when you, what was your experience like in segregated schools? So when we talk about the reason why there was such a push for desegregation, mm -hmm. it's underfunding, um, under-resourced, things like that. Those were cited as reasons for desegregation. So like, yeah. what was your experience? My experience in segregated schools was we rarely got new textbooks. Every textbook <laughs> that the school passed out had some white kid's name in it from Choctaw. Mm -hmm. We get the hand-me-down books. We would get, um, I mean, the facilities at our schools were, compared to them, they were horrible. I mean, you know, the locker rooms, the uh, the physical complex of the school. Um, you know, they passed a bond issue. Choctaw would get like maybe a new classroom and we get new carpets in the principal's office. Mm -hmm. That was that was that was the kind of stuff that uh, that the bond issue supported. So, you know, we just didn't have all all the um, the amenities that the white schools have. You know, we had hand me down books, uh, but we had good teachers. Mm -hmm. Our teachers, I, I'll put my teachers up against anybody. We had good teachers. Um, so that's kind of stuff we had to deal with. I mean, you know, we never had enough. Um, and when you're uh, playing baseball, we broke every bat we had. We used wooden bats then. We didn't have those aluminum bats. We broke every bat we had except one. It was a really, you know, it was like a 36 ounce bat. Nobody could swing. Mm -hmm. So we had to get through the season just with that bat and patch it up. Our other bats, we couldn't, we couldn't buy new bats. Wow. That kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah. I mean, football, our equipment was basically outdated. Uh, the high school would get, you know, all the sleek modern equipment. We have all the old <laughs> hand me down stuff again. So yeah. that's how it affected me personally, yeah. So when you talk about not getting books and things like that, but earlier you said when you went to college, you felt prepared. So why do you think, what's, why do you think that you felt so prepared despite having? less resources because of our teachers uh, because, of our, because our teachers actually <clears throat> actually cared mm -hmm. um i mean pretty pretty much most of my teachers uh they actually cared um funny thing was anytime there was an incident at langston when i was there Always, some of my teachers from high school would show up out there on campus to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, I mean, it was just the teachers. The teachers really, to me, they did a great job considering the you know equipment they had, and yeah. um, sometimes we didn't always get support from the community. Um, so that was, I mean, our teachers were the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So were you? Where were you when Oklahoma did begin to roll out desegregation? Were you in college at that time? Uh, <clears throat> some of the schools were, when I was in high school, there were some schools in Oklahoma City that were desegregated. Um, Douglas was an all-black school. Northeast was an integrated school. Uh, Central was an integrated school. The rest of them were basically all white, mm -hmm. except for Douglas, and then later Dungy. Yeah. Um, 
So the schools were, I mean, it was, it was probably after I graduated from high school when it was in the 70s when uh, the busing controversy started, mm -hmm. um, that, kind of, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I, was, I was in college or even out of college probably yeah. by the time that started, yeah. Okay. So did so you you talked about having Clara Looper as a teacher, but did mm -hmm. you have Nancy Davis or Ada Sibyl Fisher as teachers? Nancy Davis was at my high school, but she taught home ec. Okay. So I never took home economics. Um, Clara Looper. Clara Looper, and I I tell people this all the time. She was the best teacher that I ever had. Period. I say that because. She got the best, <laughs> the best out of me from out of any of my teachers. She saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. You know, every person I talk to says that about Clara Looper. No, like really? every <clears throat> single person. Joyce Jackson says, you know, she was the quiet, shy kid. Mm -hmm. But Clara saw something in her and would not let her say the shy and quiet kid. And yeah. then she became the first black newscaster on the news. And same with Joyce Henderson. And that mm -hmm. seems to be like really big. Yeah, because I mean, she uh, she did not play <laughs> in her classroom. Mm -hmm. um, when I first met her, I said, man, this is the meanest lady I've ever met in my life. I mean, I hated her home <laughs> when I first met her. But then the more, the more I got involved with her, the more I was in her classroom, yeah, she was the best. I mean, she had a way of holding your attention, of making what she talked about interesting. And uh, yeah, she was the best. I mean, yeah. why not? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I know that you weren't active really in the sit-ins, but were mm -hmm. you uh, active like in the youth council? That yeah, council? I was a member of the NAACP youth council. What was it like being part of the youth council? During that it was time? an extension of being in her classroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was the same thing. I mean, she, I mean, you know, in the youth council, they talked about stuff like, I mean, they, they emphasized education too. But they also talked about basically just, uh, you know, how to carry yourself. Um you know, how to how to um, make other people respect you. Um, but basically, I mean, they, they worked on developing uh, the student mm -hmm. to be the best they could be. It was count, once again, it was an extension of being in her classroom. Been in another ACP youth council, yeah. Uh -huh. So. Um, what about Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher? Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher. Um, <laughs> I had several classes with her at Langston. I think I had business law and some other classes. She was kind of the polar opposite of Clara Looper. And I'm just guessing because she was a college professor. By the time you get to college, I mean, you're either going to do it on your own or you're not. Mm -hmm. They're not going um, to babysit you. Yeah. So if you came to Mrs. Fisher's class, uh, she was... Uh, she was very dry. She had a dry sense of humor. And she conducted her classes kind of like the courtroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, she would lecture and, you know, you'd ask questions and she'd ask you questions and you'd have to expound. You just couldn't. It wasn't like she'd ask you a question and you'd have one word answer. She'd ask you a question that required you to basically think on your feet mm -hmm. and, um, so you had to, uh, it's kind of like answering an essay question out loud. So, and she all, this is one thing that was, was one thing that um, struck me about her class. She required you to keep a notebook, you know, just a binder. Every day in class, you took notes. Mm -hmm. At the end of the, at the end of the uh, year, you turned that notebook in and got a grade for it. Mm. Yeah. That was the only class. I never had another class that, that did that. I'm guessing that came from her law training, but I don't really know for sure. But yeah, that was one with idiosyncrasy she had. You had to keep that notebook and turn it in at the end of the uh, 
of the school of the uh, semester. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, but she was, you know, she was, uh, you know, she talked sometimes about, you know, her case mm-hmm. for the Supreme Court a little bit. She didn't talk a lot about it unless somebody pressed her. But uh, yeah, she was a, she was a good teacher too. I mean, she she uh, but she just had a different style. Yeah. Than than Mrs. Looper. Did you guys know who she was? Like when you took her class, did you know? I knew who she was because Clara Looper told me. Okay. Made sure that we knew who she was uh, before. Yeah, we knew about her. Yeah, I did. Talk to me about Langston because one thing that's really unique about this study is that Clara. Ada and Nancy all went to Langston at the same time. And all three of them did really impactful things. So Mm -hmm. like being that you attended Langston, what, what's in the water there? Like talk to me about what Langston means. Langston is probably like any other HBCU. I've been, I've been to a lot of them and it's like, the feeling that we had at Langston was, it was Langston against the world. I mean, you know, the people that went to Langston, for the most part, uh, first generation college students, um, but it was Langston against the world. And uh, your professors, they kind of beat that into your head. You know, you, you're on this all black campus now, but you know, in four years, you're gonna be out in the world, so. Once again, they, they they did their best to make sure we were prepared. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that was it. it was, yeah. She had that feeling. Yeah. It was you against the world. Because, um, you know, um, other students from other schools would come by. they come to Langston because they thought we had a party all the time, which we didn't. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was us against the world. That's To me, I think that's, that's the biggest thing because they put you in a situation and it was the same thing like in high school you know we had the physical plant was you know we was underfunded um food was <laughs> food was horrible <laughs> but you know with, with all of that together man and and and, and you kind of had a communal feeling i mean you know if somebody had food late at night you know, anybody could come by until they ran out. Uh, you know, we just kind of took care of each other. Yeah. So that, that's what it was, I think. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. Claire talks about it and she's just like, you know, and she credits Langston for who she became. Mm-hmm. So and she I, was just like, there was just something there. Like she couldn't even describe it. She was just like, there was just something It's hard there. to explain, <laughs> but, you know, it's just kind of a, I always say, <laughs> We felt like it was us against everybody else. Mm-hmm. Everybody else was against us. And um, so I think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, you just had that feeling that, okay, they put us out here <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, we're underfunded. They give us lousy food to eat. But in spite of all of that, we're still going to continue on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Are there any, what are some barriers you had to face while um, at Langston, if any? I really don't think that I had, we really had any barriers. I mean, um, other than, you know, um, just general stuff that all college students have. I mean, yeah. you know, you're always hungry. Or <laughs> <laughs> broke. <laughs> you're always broke. Yeah. Yeah. But there really was nothing from a, um, a racial standpoint that made it any it made it any worse. We had you know we had white professors mm-hmm. that we accepted they 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 accepted us and we accepted them. There was no problem there. So really, that was really you know I mean yeah. there really were there really were no barriers. I mean because at Langston that was the greatest years of my life. I yeah. go back. <laughs> You know, a heartbeat if I could, yeah. And what did you do once you graduated from Langston? What did I do once I graduated from Langston? Four days after I graduated from Langston, I was being sworn in into the Army. I got drafted uh, during the Vietnam War. 
I, grew, I had commencement exercises on a Sunday and Thursday. They were swearing me in. Um, so I spent two years in, in the Army, um, about a year and a half of that in Germany. Came back and uh, I went to work uh, at Kerr McGee um, as an accountant. I worked at Kerr McGee from uh, 1972 up to 1986 when the oil industry kind of started going downhill at the time. Uh, you don't remember this, but they had the Penn Square Bank. Yeah, Penn Square Bank basically went closed, basically closed, went bankrupt. I don't know if that's the right word, but when they shut down, um, they cut off a lot of money to the oil industry. Um, a lot of people, there were a lot of people independent oil men around the state and in Texas that dealt with Pence for a bank. So when they went under, it did really dealt the oil industry a big blow. And I worked at Kerr McGee, so they started uh, downsizing, so I left there. I went to Fleming. Fleming is a wholesale food distributor. All these IGA stores and small mom and pop stores, they, they supply them. So I went there and I worked there for 17 years until they went bankrupt. <laughs> and then I finished my career. Uh, I worked at the Office of Juvenile Affairs, State of Oklahoma. That's where I retired from. Okay. So lastly, let's talk about Brown. Brown v. Board of Education. Okay. Desegregated schools, 54. It took 18 years for Oklahoma mm -hmm. to actually do it. What are your thoughts on the effectiveness of Brown? Well... It was effective, and it got in, in, in that it got people to do something. Um, and actually, there were schools that were integrated in Oklahoma before. Uh, well, not before Brown, but after Brown. I mean, when I was um, in high school in, in, in the early '60s, yeah, there were integrated schools. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of small towns in Oklahoma that had you know small black populations. They couldn't really, it wasn't viable for them to have a black high school and a white high school, so they were pretty much forced to integrate. Um, but um, integration, as far as school goes, never really had much of an effect on me. Because you know, as I said, you know, it was segregated until I graduated, and then when they started integration, I was done with the school system. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really, I mean, Personally speaking, it didn't have much of an effect on me, no. But what about today? Like, when you think about the state of education for, like, black and brown students or students from lower socioeconomic statuses, like, would you say that the vision of Brown has been achieved today? No, I would say it, it, it has not. As a matter of fact, uh, no, I don't, I, I don't think it did. Um, probably at one time, it probably might have helped, but today, I mean, you can see what's happening in Oklahoma City public schools. They basically resegregated themselves. Um, suburban schools are integrated up to a point. Um, so Brown had an impact, but I don't think it had a lasting impact. Um, school desegregation would have happened probably even without Brown. He just might have started a little later, mm -hmm. but it was it was going to happen. So, I mean, the lasting effect of Brown is, I, I don't know, I think, I don't think in the long run it actually benefited us that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it forced some integration, but, you know, once again, um, schools are starting to resegregate. So we're kind of back to, kind of back to square one in a sense that, um, you know, kids in the inner city are uh, faced with the same problems we had, underfunding, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. And actually, to be honest with you, I think we had better teachers then. I think we had better teachers, because I know some of these teachers, and I know some of the teachers my uh, sons had, they were in school, and uh, in my mind, 
they didn't measure up to what we had because um, the teachers really cared about us, you know, as I told you before, I think. Yeah. So I don't think that, that the teaching is as, is as good as it was uh, when I was in school. But like even so, even when you talk about inner city schools and not having resources, plus not having teachers, mm -hmm. I think about the fact that like at Douglas, mm -hmm. for instance, my mom tells me about all the supplies and stuff that teachers have access to. Oh, really? And yeah. Like there's so much money spent on like professional developments mm -hmm. and where they're going to like California or New York and, um, the money that she's always spending on like books and resources for teachers who don't even use it. Mm. And so it's just, I guess it's just, it's interesting to me how black teachers were able to use so little mm. and achieve so much with their students. And now we have teachers who have like all this stuff, have all this stuff and they're still well, kind of. It goes back to uh, having a sense of community. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we were, you know, back then. We were all in the same community. So when you did well in school, the community was better. I mean, when you became a productive citizen, it made the community better. Mm -hmm. But now, I, I just don't think you have that sense of, 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 of us being all in one community like we did before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the issue. And I don't know if they'll ever come back like that. Mm -hmm. No. Well, is there anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I can talk about Clara Lupa some more. Okay. <laughs> but no, you know, like I told you before, like, she was the first one. She was the first teacher, because I had her for social studies in the seventh grade. She was the first teacher that ever really talked about stuff like uh, slavery uh, and segregation. <laughs> And because the sit-ins had started, by the time I got to her class, they'd already started. I mean, mm -hmm. they started a couple of years early. And um, it was always interesting to come back to school on Monday and listen to her tell you about what happened over the weekend. And um, she um, she was just an interesting woman. She, um, she taught us a lot about black history before uh, you know it became in vogue. By the time I got to college, you know, black history was a big thing. We'd already experienced that at Dungy under Clara Loop. I mean, we knew about, you know, Harry Tubman and uh, Frederick Douglass and just, you know, a lot of people like that. We, we knew about that because she pounded that into our heads. Mm -hmm. She was the first, and actually the only one in high school that ever talked about black history. She talked about, uh, she used to produce these plays and uh, she did one that was called The Harriet Tubman Story. I played a slave in that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And we, we took that play all over Oklahoma County. We went, we took it, you know, we did it at, at my high school. We did it, we went to Douglas and did it. I think we did it in several other little small schools around here. So we took that play kind of, kind of like on a tour. And, uh, but that was the thing, you know, I was, she made us acutely aware of basically uh, our history what our history was, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a living history. Yeah. Because she brought it to life, yeah. Did she, so she taught history, but did she teach anything else, teach you guys anything else outside of history? You mean outside of the classroom? Like, so Joyce Henderson said that she taught her how to teach, how to type and like algebra rules and stuff like that. Well, I, I kind of struggle with math. Mm -hmm. uh, not struggle. But it didn't, didn't come easy to me, still doesn't, but I got better at it. There was one year, I think it was my eighth grade year, they needed an extra math teacher. She volunteered to, her volunteered to do the math that year. That one year of math under her, I probably learned more math than I had <laughs> previously because she, it was just her teaching method, the way she, the way she taught stuff, the way she, you know, she got your attention and you know the way she reinforced what you learned yeah. uh, that you could she made people believe that they could learn this stuff and in that one year of math i had under her she i mean i really i flourished in math and, and after that i never had really any problems in really? math yeah so when you talk about her teaching method like what would she do to make the 
the content come alive <sighs> so much? Or was uh, it just like her personality? It was it was it was probably her personality. You know, I told you once before she did not play. You didn't come in her classroom and act a clown. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> that did not happen in Clara Lupa's classroom. You came in, you sat down, and you paid attention and you learned. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, I don't know if I if that's a teaching method, but <laughs> she, and then she had a way of just, you know, just making, bringing the history alive. Yeah. You know, she talked about, um, she talked a lot about Ada Lawrence Fisher. You know, you asked me if I knew about her. I did. That's because she talked about her and some other people in Oklahoma. Um, but she she said a way of commanding your attention, and it was to me it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got to the point where I think my mother was probably a little jealous about Clara. <laughs> Seriously, because you know I come home every day. I say, well, you know, Miss Lupa said this and Miss mm -hmm. Lupa said that. I think she got tired of hearing it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would she talk about Ada Lois? What would she say about her? She would just talk about, um, you know, in the context of her, of what happened to her trying to get enrolled at OU. Okay. You know, she talked about, because she knew her, I guess she knew her personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was, you know, she talked about that case more than anything yeah. about about uh, Ms. Fisher. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, anything else? <sighs> Well, let me see. My dad used to say that grandma would particip was participated in the sit-ins. In sit-ins? Mm, not to my knowledge. Okay, I was wondering. I don't think she did. Were was she involved at it in any way in like activism or? Uh she was no, not really, not 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 that kind of thing. She was okay. involved in a. Um, a lot of social clubs that okay. uh, they did stuff like you know give scholarships and but it really wasn't um, it really wasn't like a civil rights activism but they she 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 was involved with these clubs that 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 got involved in the community yeah okay but it wasn't like civil rights no uh -uh. okay yeah it was kind of you know I um, it was. Uh, but no, she didn't. Huh? I don't know where Keith got that from. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> He's always saying something. <laughs> okay. Um, but the couple of sit-ins that I participated in, it was basically, uh, I'm sure Joyce told you about this. They meet uh, up at Calvary in the mm -hmm. morning. And, oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, they say prayers and sing a few hymns and they march downtown. And you get a lot of verbal abuse from uh, really? from uh, bystanders. Yeah. How yeah. old were you when you did the? Film? I was probably eleven or twelve. Yeah. Dang. I was young. See, I I started school when I was five. Mm -hmm. I finished high school at sixteen. So when I was in the seventh grade, I just turned eleven. Wow. Yeah. So. So you guys were that young participating in? Yeah, some younger than me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're because at, at most of the sit-ins, it was always kids. Mm -hmm. There was a few adults, you know, Mrs. Looper and um, email, uh, email Port and a few other people, but it was you know ninety percent children. Kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it what, the the few times you went? Was it scary? Were you scared? No, I never was actually afraid. Um, I just thought you know. You get, I got like, once again, I get mad more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I never, I never really had much fear. Sit-ins here were, they were not like uh, a lot of the stuff you see on TV about what happened like in Alabama and Mississippi. Yeah. It never got that violent. Uh, I never remember anybody getting beat up, uh, any of the sit-ins being actually attacked. You know, they got arrested, but they never really actually got attacked by, uh, you know, outsiders. Like the stuff you see that um you seen that movie Selma. Mm -hmm. That kind of no, it wasn't it wasn't like that at all. It was yeah. you know, they were they would call you names, but that that was pretty much the extent of it. Why was grandma scared to let you go? 
I think, well, because, you know, she knew a lot more about the world than I did. I was, I was naive to a point at that point. I mean, you know, you know, she'd been, she experienced a lot more life. She knew how people really were at the time. I probably didn't realize the danger that we were in. I was just, you know, we were out. You, you know, you get mad, but you really, I don't really think I had really, it didn't really sink in on me how really dangerous that that kind of activity was at that time. Mm -hmm. And, um, but her, that was probably part of it. And um, the other part of it was during that time, you know, a lot of this, again, these, these were all children doing this. Most of the, uh, the adult community in Oklahoma City had nothing to do with sit in. They just, they just didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So it was probably, you know, her being afraid for me for one, and then just not, I don't know how I want to say this, just not. Um, and then, you know, I told you she was kind of jealous of, <laughs> I think she was jealous of Clara. I think that probably was part of it too. Yeah. Yeah, because she probably felt I was kind of getting away from her. Yeah. And uh, so that was probably part of it. But, you know, it just wasn't a lot of um, enthusiasm among the adult population for activism. Why do you think that is? It's because of the way they were raised. I mean, they were, you got to remember these. My mother lived through the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, they were concerned more about, you know, putting food on the table and clothes on your back than they were about whether you could eat at a restaurant or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was their main concern was, you know, how am I gonna feed these, you know, my two children? How am I, how am I gonna buy clothes for them? They get sick, you know? So that was that was, that was was her concern more than anything else was, was you know, taking care of her family. And yeah. she just, and you know, she didn't have time to be honest with you to um, do a lot of that stuff. Yeah. She worked, you know, she worked. And, on weekends, you know, she had to deal with me and Keith. <laughs> <laughs> so she really didn't, to be honest, she didn't, she didn't really have the time. Um, probably that was, that was, that was her biggest thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just her. I mean, you know, it was every, everybody in the neighborhood. No, you know, none, none of the people I grew up around, the adults I grew up around were ever involved in anything like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, Let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, I'm trying to think. When you were growing up, did you know you were poor? I did, but I didn't, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I knew it, but it's not something that I dwelled on. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, because everybody else was too. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it wasn't like, you know, I was, I was poor, and, you know, around the corner there was somebody living in a mansion. No, mm -hmm. around the corner there was somebody just as poor as, as we were. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I mean, I knew it, I knew mm -hmm. it, but it didn't really, I won't say it didn't bother me, but it's really what drove me to go to school and, you know, try to make a better life for myself, yeah. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, you know, I was driven, you know, mm -hmm. I said, if I ever have children and a family, you know, we're not gonna live like, you know, we're gonna live a lot better than this. Yeah. That was what drove me, yeah. So yeah. from that standpoint, I guess that we could say it was kind of not good, but um, it drove me, it inspired me. It was inspiring more than anything, because I knew that was, that was another way. I knew enough and I saw enough from other, you know, once I left that community, how other people lived mm -hmm. to know that, yeah, we were poor. So, yeah, I knew it. And like you talked about how angry and you were at segregation. What did it feel like for you when public facilities and places started opening up and desegregating? Like, what was that feeling like for you? It was a good feeling. Um, um, it was, you felt as if, um, you know, that finally, um, uh, there's going to be some changes in this country and which there were, uh, 
but there never has been enough in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 it felt good to know, like, like one example is Spring Lake Park. Mm -hmm. Spring Lake Park was segregated up until I was uh, probably a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. That was 1963, 1964. So before then, we couldn't go to Spring Lake Park. And then even after they integrated Spring Lake Park, we couldn't use the swimming pool. <laughs> I never did get to get in that pool. And they finally just closed the pool. Uh, that took care of that problem. So. Yeah, yeah. so I never got to use the pool. But yeah, um, you know, segregation. It, it, um, but yeah, I always think about Spring Lake Park when you talk about segregation because we wanted to go to that park. And there's another park called Wedgwood. Okay. You never heard of Wedgwood Park? It was the same way. I, ne I, ne I, have, I never did get to go to Wedgwood. Because it integrated later than Spring Lake. It finally integrated, but it was after Spring Lake Park. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you can think of? Uh, <clears throat> uh. All right, nothing else unless you have some more questions. I think we got everything covered. I can't okay. think of anything else to expand on. Uh, has it been that long? I mean, it's been yeah, long. it Ooh. really flies by. I hope I gave you some 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 good answers. I hope I gave you, you a halfway decent interview. No, you did. I'm. I'm sorry so, about getting emotional. No, but. it's fine. Like people do all the time, and it really adds to the interview, honestly. Okay. But like I was listening to your stuff, and I'm already picking out phrases to yeah. use. So okay. yeah, you gave okay. so much. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, um, thank you, Adam.